Our topic today is North Africa with particular emphasis on Algeria. If you picture North Africa as a picket fence, picket fence, something like that, you will see in your mind's eye that Morocco is the westernmost, leftmost on a map. And if you move to the right or to the east, next comes Algeria, the topic today, and then Libya with little Tunisia jammed in the tips of your picket fence between Algeria and Libya. Egypt is the easternmost part of this picket fence that I'm trying to describe to you. Algeria is strategically located and is capable, as it is a capable partner of the United States. The two countries have joint diplomatic, law enforcement, economic, and security interests. The United States and Algeria conduct frequent civilian and military exchanges. The last of these was the U.S.-Algeria Strategic Dialogue in January of 2019. We have with us today, especially all the way from Paris, France, at Dahlia Ghanem, who is a resident scholar of the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center. Say that fast and we'll see how you do. It's like mixed biscuits or one of those mouthfuls that we try as kids. Professor Ghanem's research focuses on Algeria's political, economic, social, and security developments. Her research also examines political violence, radicalization, civil military relationships, trans-border dynamics, and gender. Ghanem has been a guest speaker on these issues at international conferences. She is a regular commentator in different Arab and international print and audiovisual media. Ghanem is currently writing a book on the resilience of the Algerian regime scheduled to be published in 2022 by Paul Grav Macmillan. Prior to joining Carnegie in 2013, she was a teaching associate at Williams College in Massachusetts. She also served as a research assistant at the Center for Political Analysis and Regulation at the University of Versailles. Let us welcome Dahlia Gadam. It's your, we're yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dan. Thank you to the Chapaqua Library uh, for having me. Uh, so I'm going to have a few uh, introduction remarks, uh, a general overview of Algeria, but the state of affairs also in the country right now, and uh, maybe um, you can you can come in and you know ask me a few questions, and then I will have a general uh, overview on, on on the Maghreb. Uh, so, uh, as you may know, you know Algeria gained its independence in 1962 after seven years and a half of a deadly war uh, against the French and 132 years of colonization. And as sociologist Abdel Malek Sayed once said, uh, to an exceptional colonization, an exceptional decolonization. The country after the independence needed full reconstruction at all levels. And during Algeria's first three decades as an independent state, the army, uh, which liberated the country as a matter of fact, played an important role um, in uh, politics. As such, it had a very central place in politics. The army consistently manipulated, if I may say, the political arena from behind the scenes. It was ruling without governing. Uh, through, uh, Though it never governed the country, the army exercised to varying degrees at varying uh, level uh, in time, supervision, and even outright control, and sometimes intervened directly in matters of state. 
The Army's action in 1992 marked a qualitative change in its approach to Algerian politics. That year, in 1992, the Army intervened to scrap parliamentary elections that the Islamic Salvation Front, an Islamist uh, party, was poised to win and arrested thousands of party members. A bloody civil war followed between state apparatuses and jihadist groups that mushroomed all around the country. Some more than actually 150,000 people died during what was came to be called the Black Decade. Seven, no less than 7,000 people disappeared and some $20 billion of material damages, uh, damage was registered. Before that, in 1998, uh, 1989, sorry, the Algerian government responding to dangerous domestic agitation, which in turn brought international pressure to bear on Algiers, appeared to embark on a course of political liberalization. So from the independence of Algeria in 1962 to 1989, it was an authoritarian state. It was a one party system. Uh, but in 1989, the government promulgated the new constitution that established a multi-party system. Yet Algeria's transition in 1989 from single party rule to a multi-party system did not lead to democracy. And actually, that is the main argument of my upcoming book. Uh, Algerian regime, which I argue in that book, went from the outright authoritarianism that had characterized it uh, since independence in 1962 to what is known as competitive authoritarianism. And there's such a hybrid regime, which mixes elements of democracy and authoritarianism. Opposition forces admittedly, admittedly enjoy access to democratic institution and can contest power. Nevertheless, the political arena remains titled in favor of state-backed entities and individual. There is no trend toward democratization, despite the uh, big and mass movement that took place in Algeria in February 2019, known as the Hirak. Uh, in fact, Algeria today is more a continuation of its pre-1989 um, iteration that it is in any sort of precursor to democracy. Despite periodic change in government, including the ostensibly all important presidency, Algeria is for all intents and purposes still run by a military backed regime that assumed power when the country gained independence in 1962. Um, the country is seen rightly so to a certain extent by Western countries as an island of stability in a tumultuous region. That's true. 12 years after the Arab Spring that took place in 2011, Algeria did not witness the Arab Spring, and the Algerian regime has shown a significant degree of resilience and adaptability, despite the, the, the big uh, movement, protest movement that took place in 2019. So the country's relative peace and the regime's longevity reflect the capacity capacity of elites to dispense political and economic resources in controlled manner. This approach has created an appearance of change and pluralism that has allowed the regime to absorb social dissatisfaction, keep society in check, and strengthen the foundation of its rule. But the regime's success to date does not mean that these self-perpetuating mechanisms will work indefinitely. To give you just an idea of the regime toolkit to keep its system and to maintain itself. So the regime masters the art of concession, as I call it, without fundamental change. It's change without change, as Giuseppe de Lampedusa said it once. So first element, despite shakeups, reforms, and routine election, the army still rules the country. It is not governing again, but it is ruling the country. And this arrangement uh, will likely continue for the foreseeable future. Second point, opposition parties have shown little inclination to promote change. Indeed, they have embraced the rules of the game and replicated the same illiberal patterns they decry. 
third point, civil organization, because Algeria is very well known as, you know, in the Middle East as um, the country with the most dense uh, civil society organizations. But, well, despite uh, uh, the, the, the existence of uh, civic uh, society organization, they have been co-opted, marginalized, and coerced because the regime exploited their internal problems and undemocratic structures. They have failed to serve as a bridge between the country leaders and their citizens. Four point, selective economic liberalization has chiefly profited select politically connected individuals. And here, Algeria's leaders used patronage and co corruption with the network of clients and hand their support base. They extended their support base to perpetuate their power. Fifth point and the last, Corruption. Corruption serves as a key feature of Algeria's system of governance and an important conflict resolution mechanism for stabilizing the political order. Of course, what I just have said about Algeria can be said also about other countries in the, uh, in the region, uh, in which we've seen more and more since, uh, despite or despite the Arab Spring, like in Tunisia and Morocco and so on and so forth, the same self-perpetuating uh, mechanism. Um, I will stop here. Uh, Don, maybe you want to jump in, and I will continue maybe with the U.S.-Algeria relationships. Okay, I'm, I'm back. Anyway, yes. <laughs> I, thank you for that introduction. I asked you to comment about the uh, development through revolution, much like in the United States, into what became a military dictatorship rather than a democracy. I am old enough to have lived through the era of de Gaulle and the agreement in France to let their colony go. And uh, I wonder with, with you if we could discuss some of that because in a way Algeria was a contradiction because it was mainly a Muslim country as I understand it. And at the same time, they were growing grapes and making wine and, and alcohol was one of their big exports when the French were there. And I was curious as to what the economy of Algeria is now. What is it based on? How does it work? And is, is it working? Well, uh, Algeria is a rentier state, uh, you know, um, hydrocarbon oil and gas represent approximately 95% of the exports. So uh, there is uh, a problem of diversification of the economy. Actually, since, uh, you know, um, the independence of the country, uh, despite the difficulties, the successive government have, you know, tried many things. Ben Bella, for instance, in the 16, tried uh, the 60s, tried the autogestion, which is self-management, uh, of farms and um, enterprises, and then uh, Boumedien, uh, you know, uh, get rid of that. But they, he tried uh, the policy of industry industrialisant, uh, you know, focusing on heavy industry. Uh, but uh, it was always uh, with this, you know, socialist uh, uh, approach uh, to the economy. And of course, this is a country that is very rich in gas and oil. And so uh, there was no need for the success of government to focus in a way on other uh, sources of incomes. For instance, one the thing that many journalists ask me, uh, this is a big uh, country. It's um, it's six times the the, the superficies of France, and uh, this is a very beautiful country. And yet we have almost no uh, tourism uh, industry. And so many governments have been talking, you know, about uh, enhancing this and the infrastructure and so on and so forth. But they always failed to do it. Or in another way, I would say that there was no political will to do it. Because, um, as you may know, in a rentier state, uh, corruption is very high because it feeds patronage networks and clientelism. Um, and so um, each time the regime felt in danger, 
it dispensed a very generous handout when it was uh, available, of course. So for instance, in 2011, when the Arab Spring took place in neighboring Tunisia, the Algerian government was very quick to answer. Back then, Algeria was holding the eighth position worldwide in terms of exchange of economy, uh, uh, in terms of reserves uh, for um, exchange reserve. Uh, and so Algeria, I think in 2013, had something around $194 billion of exchange reserves. And so with that, you know, very comfortable, uh, you know, financial cash. And when the Arab Spring uh, took place, the Algerian government was very quick to answer with very generous handout to all segment of the population. But in particular, they targeted youth and unemployment to quell social dissent, to stifle the voices of dissent, and to buy social peace. And so when the oil prices, uh, you know, uh, decrease in mid-June 2014, the Algerian government had still enough exchange reserve to quell dissent. But when the 2019 uh, Hirak uh, peaceful demonstration took place, then the, the question was, what is the Algerian government going to do? Because we had the, the crisis um, of uh, the oil shock in March 2020, and hence, you know, the Algerian government had to, sp to spend more and more in order, you know, to, um, to, uh, to meet the demands of the people. Let us not forget that this is a country that is also have very heavy subsidies. Everything is subsidized in Algeria, from education to health, everything is subsidized, to flour, to bread, to butter, everything. And so it spent a lot of on subsidies. So it was very important for the government not to touch to subsidies because it was scared to, 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 to have, you know, demonstration and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, today the barrel, I think, is flirting with the, the $95, $96, maybe, maybe less. And so here we, we have, again, a government, a regime that is able, you know, to, to have some, some period of, of tranquility. But even that, we have the pandemic 19, uh, the COVID pandemic 19 that hit Algeria very strong, as many uh, neighboring countries. And so that meant that the Algerian government had to spend more and more for public health and so on and so forth. So the question is, uh, very simply put, uh, this is a regime like many other regimes in the region has been using the carrot and the stick. Whenever the carrot was available, they would use it to you know, buy social peace. Now the question is, what will happen as this carrot is actually reducing? Are they going to use the stick or no? That's a great summary of the present conditions. Thank you. I, I look at the history of uh, the Arab, so-called Arab Spring, and I see, for example, that in Tunisia, the uh, president, Ben Ali, stepped down after 24 years in power. And the same thing happened in Egypt, where the Mubarak was in power for 24 years. And then we look at uh, Libya, where Gaddafi was in power for 42 years. These are very, very long times in our lifetime, half, half our normal lifetime sort of thing in the case of Gaddafi. And uh, it is said by some that uh, that part of the world cannot get along with democracy. And I wondered what your thoughts were that do the, do, the, do the people of the region look forward more to stability than to democracy and looking at stability through a dictator or a military regime? What, what are your feelings about the people themselves? 
Uh, well, I, I don't agree, you know, John, with this culturalist approach that says that Arabs are not ready for democracy. There is no such a such a, a, a thing. Actually, Tunisia, that very small country, as you said, stuck between Algeria and Libya, uh, showed its ability and the thirst of its people for democracy, for better governance, for transparency, and so on and so forth. And it is Tunisia, that exact small country that actually launched launched uh, the wave of the Arab Spring uh, that hit the entire uh, region in 2011. Uh, so I don't believe, uh, again, in this culturalist approach, but I think that, uh, you know, change takes time. So many people, for instance, you know, 10 years after the Arab Spring have been saying, you know, that, um, uh, you know, that um, the, the, the Arab Spring isn't that of a positive, uh, doesn't have a positive, you uh, you know, uh, results, but I do believe that change takes time and it will, uh, you know, take time for these uh, countries and these regimes to change. Again, uh, when we, we look at Algeria, for instance, it went from outright authoritarianism to a, a hybrid regime. And that's still, you know, something positive. I mean, I live in an era where I can say, almost whatever I want in Algeria, of course, there is risk to, to end up in jail, but still I have the power to say it. And the Hirak, for instance, the, the social movement of 2019 broke that wall of fear. My parents lived in a period, in an era in Algeria where you couldn't even pronounce the name of the president. And so there is, you know, change. Of course, it takes time. Uh, today, you know, what's going on in Tunisia, of course, many would, uh, would uh, you know, uh, would tell you that, uh, you know, the, it is as if the Arab uh, Spring never happened. But I would say that, you know, um, uh, the result is here. Tunisia and Tunisian toppled a 23 years old dictatorship and they did it alone and again 10 years is a short time to assess the impact of the revolution uh, i still have hope and i do believe that this is going to take a lot of time a lot of energy maybe another generation but uh, these uh, are also uh, this is also a region that is uh, today no longer what it used to be thanks or due to technology uh, today's algerians tunisian moroccans are connected to the world uh, today they are present you know on social media on twitter on facebook there is something like 19 million algerians on Facebook. Uh, what we lived, for instance, in the 90s during the civil war, that was, you know, uh, historian Benjamin Stora called the war, the civil war in the 90s, une guerre sans image, uh, a war without images, because back then really nobody knew what was going on in Algeria, because it was total omerta on what, uh, what was the conflict about. And the, 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 the narrative that was going out abroad in Western country was only the narrative that the region Jim wanted uh, its, uh, um, its uh, uh, partners to hear. But this kind of approach is no longer possible uh, today. We have social media, uh, despite the fact that, of course, internet sometimes is cut, like in China, and you don't have access to some websites. Still, people are highly connected. This is a new generation that is more well educated than its parent, that is highly connected, highly educated, that speaks several languages, and that do know what it wants. So this is why I say at the end of my book that while you know change hasn't been really about change, but rather about cosmetic change in Algeria. Uh, this new generation will not accept that, you know, statu quo and that social contract for a while. And I believe, and I will stop on that, that, you know, we had several waves of the Arab Spring. You know, we had the first one in 2011 with, you know, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and that we had the second one in 2019 with Algeria, Iraq, Sudan, and even Lebanon. And I believe that the third wave is not, um, is it's not that far. I have my last question to you, and it will open it up to, the, to others, is uh, Tunis, in the case of Tunisia, it's not being left alone in order to work through its... Uh, I was thinking now of the number of tourists who were killed, for example, by others who came in 
and destabilize or tried to destabilize the country by attacking its main, Tunisia's main source of income, which is tourism, tourism, as I understand it. So is this a, a, a destabilizing problem, these outside groups who are convinced that they know the truth and the future? In a way, in, in a way, the Arab upheavals, you know, in 2011 have aided, uh, if I may say, jihadist groups in uh, getting the revenge from uh, these different regime. And Tunisia is a case in, post, uh, 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 in point, and Libya as well, because the collapse of Gaddafi uh, in Libya and the downfall of uh, Ben Ali administration resulted in the release of thousands of jihadists, of inmates, Islamic inmates, Islamist inmates, including many jihadists. And organizations such as Ansar al-Sharia, for instance, or the Islamic State, you know, uh, tried to establish themselves in Libya, in which they, uh, they succeeded, but also in Tunisia. But again, uh, like in Algeria in the 90s, uh, these jihadist groups are the pure products of their society. While it is true that they might have brought the ideology from abroad, uh, meaning from the Islamic State in Syria, but uh, again, these uh, young people are joining these jihadist groups for reasons that are intrinsically linked to their local, to their region, and to their neighborhood. Um, I did, you know, my PhD thesis about the reasons behind the radicalization of thousands of Algerians in the 90s. And uh, there are many reasons that led many Algerians back then, and that led Tunisian today. You know, Tunisia is believed to have sent something like around 6,000 Tunisian to the Islamic State organization in Syria. And so, uh, what were the reasons that pushed uh, these people who asked for democracy in 2011 to join the Islamic State in 2014? Well, these has been, you know, reason. Uh, these reasons have to be found in their local uh, grievances. You know, there is, for instance, the thirst for revenge because the indiscriminate violence of the security forces against them has been terrible. Uh, there is a desire to prove oneself. There is sometimes a simple desire, you know, to to earn. A, live, a livelihood because many of these youth did not have, you know, stable uh, source of incomes and the Islamic State or another jihadist group came, you know, and promised them, uh, you know, to earn a good living. So there is a lot of reasons and, you know, we can, we can have another conference on that. But again, I don't think, you know, that uh, there are foreigners who are trying to destabilize this country. It is more that there are local, you know, grievances that haven't been addressed by these successive governments, you know, for decades and decades, and then they exploded because uh, people are no longer eager to take it. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Mal to wake up and <laughs> ask his traditional question at this moment in time. What is confusing, Mal, is that normally you tell us whether we should use Q&A or chat for the questions. And I look at my screen here and I've got two questions on Q&A and five on chat. And I was curious as to what you'd like us to do out there in this world. Well, thank you, Don. I was about to say for the first thing, we're using Q&A as the primary source. We do see some chat, but at least on my screen, it shows up only briefly and I can hardly make a notes about it. What, what's coming through. Please use Q&A. One of the chat things that quickly went over my screen was the question, Dahlia, what's the relationship of Algeria to its neighbors? You've talked a lot about essentially an internal kind of a view, and particularly what's its relationship to Morocco? Okay. Yeah, so, yes, um, yes. Uh, well, this is a country that, again, we need to understand, uh, to understand the foreign policy of Algeria, we need to understand, you know, to go back to history. And it's good because we started with that. And I said that this is a country that suffered from 132 years of colonization and seven and a half years of deadly war against the French. And so at the independence of the, oh, and Algeria was, you know, one of the leaders of the Bandung 
Zoom uh, conference and the, the, the movement of the non-aligned. So this has, to, uh, the, the foreign policy of Algeria today needs to be put in that framework. This is still a country that is very jealous of its national integrity, but it is also very, very, very careful about the integrity of the national territorial integrity of its neighbors. So Algeria has this policy, I would say it's simply, simply of non-interference and la uh, non-ingérence, non-interference. Algeria never, never would interfere in the uh, internal affairs of its neighbors. And so in that matter, it is a country that will, you know, uh, have an, impo uh, an approach of cooperation. Uh, so this is the case with Tunisia. For instance, Algeria has been cooperating with Tunisia for decades now. Um, with the Arab uh, world, the situation is different depending which country we are talking about. For instance, in, uh, in, uh, if we talk about the Saudi, Algeria has a pretty, you know, cold relationship with that part of the MENA region and with its direct neighbor, which is one of the most important, which leads us to the second question. I'm, I'm trying to answer everything in a very quick um, uh, way. Uh, Morocco and Algeria have a very difficult relationship. Uh, this is a relationship that has been of cooperation. As you know, Morocco helped the FLN, the National Liberation Front, during the War of Independence. However, right after the independence, there was a conflict between Algeria and Morocco over the border. And in 1963, there was a war between the two called La Guerre des Sables, the Sand War. And since then, the Moroccan and the Algerian have been struggling over one very important and crucial matter, which is the Western Sahara. They do not agree on the Western Sahara question. And this leads me to US, uh, US Algeria relationship, because the administration of Trump actually recognized the, the uh, Moroccan sovereignty over, over the Western Sahara. And so that led to US-Algeria relation uh, becoming a bit more complicated than what they used to be. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, you know, Trump uh, in December 2020 uh, took the decision to recognize a Morocco sovereignty over the Western Sahara in exchange for Rabat normalizing its relationship with Israel. So Algiers was taken aback when Trump granted Moroccans what they had wished for decades. Uh, it was an irrevocable diplomatic success for Morocco and that's a fact. So uh, the Abra Abraham Accords, what came to be called as the Abraham Accords, uh, have been problematic for Algerian. That is, first of all, you know, pro-Palestinian, and that has this very strong stance uh, that will not change anytime soon. While it is true that there are ideological implications, as I said, and co a consideration to this, there are also security ones. For Algiers, in the perception of the policymakers in Algiers and the military high-ranking, such accords are dangerous for national security, but also for the regional security um, of, uh, of uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And so, uh, you know, these uh, uh, Moroccan-Israeli uh, accord or rapprochement is perceived as dangerous uh, because um, in the long run, uh, you know, with this military and security cooperation between the two, Algiers thinks that uh, Morocco might become military superior to Algeria. Uh, there is also contentious with the US over Syria. Uh, Algiers, for instance, have taken you know, a pro-government position towards Damascus and wants to see Syria reintegrated into the Arab League. Algeria is organizing actually in March 2022 uh, the, 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 the Arab League, uh, is hosting the Arab League. And so so it is going to push for uh, Syria to come back to the Arab League. Um, and this is problematic because the US doesn't want that, but because the Americans do not agree with 
uh, that and are calling, uh, you know, Arab uh, states not to, to normalize with the Assad regime. Uh, also, there is some conservative uh, voices in Washington and some Moroccans and Israeli voices also that are pushing for a narrative according to which Algeria is seeking a rapprochement with Iran for the latter to become more active in Africa and in the Sahel uh, region. I think there is a lot of propaganda going on on this fake news and an exaggeration uh, in this narrative because um, uh, you know, uh, in this narrative, uh, uh, you know, it sees Algeria as somebody, as, 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 the, as a country, sorry, that is actually sponsoring Iranian-backed proxies in the regions, non-state actors in the Sahel and Africa. And I think really that this is totally, I would say, uh, unrealistic, you know, to think about this, because again, Algeria, most powerful political actor in the country is the military and the military, they are very worried about political Islam uh, since the black decade in the 90s. So with a country that has little to no uh, lobbying in Washington, I can understand why such allegations are easy to make against the other country. But bottom line, uh, U.S., Algeria, you know, have common security interest and cooperation is likely to continue, especially that I believe that the U.S. do not want to see Algeria move even closer to China and Russia. And again, for the U.S., uh, they rediscovered, if I may say, Algeria after 9-11, because after 9-11, the American discovered that there was there in North Africa, a big country that has suffered from terrorism. And before 9-11 victims, there was 150,000 victims of Algerian uh, Islamism. And so the Bush administration back then got closer to Algeria. And under, under Obama, it was a different story. And to Today, with the Abraham Accord, there is a, so, some some sort of cold between the two uh, countries. But I do believe that they will find their way um, to to settle, you know, this this, uh, um, or at least to warm up this relationship. Let us not forget that Algeria remains a pivotal actor in the fight against terror in the Sahel. Now. I was, hope, I was hoping you go a little further with the Sahel. The Sahel, as I understand it, is a region just south, okay, of, of what we normally call North Africa. And they're having a lot of difficulty, a lot of upheaval. Could you go a little bit further in terms of, is there any implication for what's happening in the Sahel to, to what's going on in Algeria or its neighbors? And you've got you've got Mali, for example, with uh, yes. Europe being uh, involved. Exactly. So, not to 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 go too much uh, into details, I would say um, Algeria, you know, has uh, shares borders with the Mali and Niger, and and uh, uh, basically, to say it in very simple way. To protect its backyard, it's to protect its uh, its 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 country. So protecting Mali and helping Mali protect its own border, it's protecting Algeria. So there is a big jihadist activity going on in uh, in northern Mali. Uh, just as a, remind, a reminder, in 2013, the northern part of Mali have been taken by jihadist groups, among them Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, um, which is uh, historically. Al Qaeda is an offshoot actually of an Algerian jihadist group that was born in Algeria in the 90s called the GSPC, Group Salafis pour la Prédication et le Jihad, that decided in 2007 to merge with Al Qaeda and they became Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. And the leadership of this group always remained Algerian, even if it is recruiting or it has been recruiting locally in the different Sahelian countries, but the leadership remained Algerian. And so that has always been, if I may say, a castet, you know, uh, a headache for the Algerian authorities because they've been, you know, um, um, 
fighting this jihadist groups for, uh, for decades now, and they've been also, you know, uh, trying to, 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 to avoid the, the jihadist group coming back to the northern of the country. And so they pushed for them to go south of Algeria, and by pushing them to go south of Algeria, they expanded to Mali and Niger and to Sahelian countries. But again, here again, we need to remember that there are local grievances and local elements that push uh, locals to go and join jihadist groups. So uh, what happened in 2013 in Mali is that uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb with other jihadist groups took up and um, took uh, northern part of Mali and then the French intervened with Operation uh, Serval and then Operation Berkan. And things got complicated because, you know, when there are too much, you know, countries in a country trying to solve a problem, they make it most of the time um, even worse, especially when, you know, the French back then didn't want, you know, I think the French still did not understand that there will be no solution in Mali without the help of the Algerians. The Algerians have been, you know, involved in Mali since the 90s when there was the uh, Tuareg uh, revolution, um, rebellion, and so they tried, they always had a mediation strategy, a diplomatic approach. Algiers uh, has always pushed for diplomatic approach and for all parties to try to talk to each other. And so they are trying, you know, to push for a rapprochement or a kind of dialogue between the government, the Malian government and the different, you know, uh, groups that exist. That is also what they did in Tunisia in 2011. They push, you know, the, the 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 different parties, including the Islamists, to open a dialogue rather because they learned, you know, from their mistakes in the 90s. So Algeria plays a very important role in the protection of, you know, its backyard, but in the protection of the borders of other countries. But again, it is single-handed in that fight, because if you look at the Algerian army, this is one of the most powerful armies in the region. Uh, this is one of the most powerful, most experienced, and so on and so forth. And then when you compare it to the Malian, for instance, or the Nigerian, we are very far from that. You know, there, is, uh, there isn't the same level of training, there isn't the same level of equipment. And so the country is single-handed in, uh, in this fight, if I may say. Uh, but again, uh, the situation is worsening in Mali and in other neighboring countries when actually jihadist group expanded, uh, you know, and they were able to expand and to recruit so I believe that um, th th this is a region that has been, you know, a quagmire for, for you know, uh, for Algeria, but also for, for the French. And I believe that as long as the French and the Algerians do not sit together and decide for, uh, decide on a common approach to Mali among other Sahelian countries, the situation is going to uh, to worsen. To, cha to change the topic a bit, there are two or three questions asking about religion within that area of the world, and uh, looking particularly within Algeria as to one question is, is Algeria an Islamic affiliated state? Another one is, is uh, could Dahlia speak on the status of religious mi minorities in Algeria? And uh, so there are, there's quite an interest in that uh, part of our world, the, re the religious and belief system. Yes, sure. Uh, no, Algeria is not an Islamic uh, state. This is um, not the case at all. Uh, in the constitution, it's written that Islam is the religion of the state. However, uh, it is not an Islamic state uh, of any kind, you know, uh, like Iran. Um, you, you, you have a population that is 99% uh, Sunni Muslim, you have a small few minorities who are on paper at least um, free 
uh, to practice their faith. But then again, when you read, you know, uh, the law, uh, the frontier between uh, practicing your faith and proselyting is very thin. And so basically the authorities under sometimes the fallacious um, accusation of uh, proselyting can arrest uh, some uh, people uh, who belong to another uh, faith. Um, when it, what was, uh, I think I answered this question. What was the second one? Second one. Oh, second about one. minorities. Yeah, minorities. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, on paper, uh, it's all good. As I said, uh, you have the right to practice your own religion. But again, proselyting is forbidden by law and it is punished. And so um, the, 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 the authorities can punish you for that or can simply, you know, accuse you of doing so to, uh, to uh, punish you for uh, being in the opposition or for, you know, yeah. in order to, yes. Another, another, another question is, uh, are there any in, uh, aspirations, inspirations for political change within the ruling regime? Are there more enlightened military people, for example? I guess that question alludes to. Well, you know, there is this theory, I think, uh, that it, I think it was Samuel Huntington that said that it has this theory that said that uh, a more professional when we, uh, when we move toward a more professional army uh, it, it's systematically become less politicized i think that's not the case at all in algeria and in other parts uh, of 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 the world actually uh, again this is an army of course it's different today than what the one that used to 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 be uh, in 1962 but still it is the same uh, you know uh, in a way it is the army um, so uh, I have a tendency to talk about an army as an, uh, a monolithic uh, a block, which is not the case. There are factions within the military, but uh, uh, let me do it in that way because it's easier. This is the army that basically liberally, uh, liberated the country. And it is an army that is, uh, you know, the army of the people. Why? Because this is an army that is uh, based on conscription, okay? So basically, uh, when the Algerian uh, regime said, c'est l'armée du peuple, it's the people army, it is really the people army. But then again, you know, I, I keep saying that when the demonstrations happened in 2019, for instance, and even though Algerians went uh, down the street and they said, which means we want a civilian state and not a military state. They never called um, slogans or chanted armée dehors or, you know, get out of the army. They really targeted the top echelon of the military. They said les généraux dehors, which means the generals out. So even in the conception of the Algerians, there is distinction between the top echelon of the military and the military as a whole and as an institution, which is still considered by a majority of Algerian as the most respected and the most powerful institution in the country that is able to protect this country. And one of the slogans also that have been chanted during the entire time of the Hirak was which means the people and the army are brothers. So again, I think Algerians are very aware of the distinction that they make. They are very aware that there is this top echelon of the, 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 the military, the generals, some generals who are taking important decisions, who are ruling behind the scene, but it is not for them the institution as a whole that remains in the eyes of many Algerian as really a lib uh, the, the, the army that liberated and that saved also the country in the 90s. Um, this is an army that is seen by many Algerians as the one that fought Islamist uh, jihadist violence in the 90s and saved between quotes in a way uh, the country. So again, there is this distinction uh, between the two. Now, whether this new generation of military is going to um, 
to be more enlightened, I think the comment said. I'm not sure. I think, you know, the former generation has its training in the USSR. This new has its training in America, more or less, or in France. But the kind or the type of um, training doesn't really impact their view and their dogma, you know. Uh, the army sees itself as the protector of the nation. And as such, they do not conceive, you know, they have a very messianic image of themselves. They do not see uh, that giving the power to civilian is something, um, uh, uh, actually, they see it as something dangerous. Looking sideways at the other countries, for example, Egypt, where is Egypt, if anywhere, within the, the interests of uh, Algeria and the, the Western parts? Well, you know, uh, Egypt and Algeria have pretty good relations, depending on uh, on the time and whether the two fo football teams are playing. Uh, <laughs> football is very important in these two nations, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and they fight over it. But, uh, you know, they've been uh, as two, you know, big countries, these two behemoths have been fighting over regional, you know, regional superiority. Uh, so Egypt has been, you know, very active uh, in the region, but also it's now becoming, you know, has been more and more active in Libya, but also trying to be uh, more and more in the Sahel. And so we have these two behemoths trying each of them to, 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 to gain more power. And for Algeria, I think, you know, Algeria has witnessed uh, at least in the last uh, um, term of Abdelaziz Bouteflika, uh, uh, of President Abdelaziz Bouteflika, as he was, you know, hit by stroke in 2013, and he was debilitated uh, by the stroke, um, the, uh, Algeria disappeared uh, in a way from the international arena and from the regional arena. And now with this new president and, you know, with the foreign minister, Ramtan Namamra, you can see that there is a will from Algiers to come back on the regional scene and to be more proactive about what's going on. So I think we will witness um, more, more, uh, you know, maybe diplomatic confrontation, if I may say, between these two countries and even with Morocco, because the situation between the two countries is, uh, you know, lately it the two countries reached an unprecedented level of, uh, of uh, confrontation with the horrible you know, accusation from uh, one part and another. Um, and so I, I believe that 2022 uh, is going to be Algeria-Morocco confrontation. I think, uh, in mm -hmm. the, yes, I, I believe that this is what we're going to see. Uh, it won't be with Egypt. It won't be, it will be with Morocco because the Abraham's Accord actually exacerbated tensions that were already there. Tell us about that accord. What, what are the details? Well, Abraham? well basically, the, the, the Trump administration accepted to recognize the, 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 the sovereignty of Morocco over Western Sahara in exchange for Morocco. Now the history, if I may just interject a moment, the Western Sahara was originally part of the part of Spain, the Spanish regime. And I understand that from my memory that the Spain walked away from that area, and True. so the that area remained a uh, vacuum, and the Moroccans lined up at the uh, border between the two countries and marched into to fill that void. And I don't remember that Algeria made an effort in the same way historically that the Moroccans did. And uh, so I, and, and then how the hell did, sorry, how did Trump get involved <laughs> was my question uh, beyond that, because that, th th this is a very strange mix of walking away, filling the void, and then a third party coming in and stamping their approval. I don't understand <laughs> where it is now. <laughs> Are oh. you able? Yeah. Yes, it, it cut a bit, but, but you know, basically, what happened is that you know the 
the, the Moroccan negated, you know, the right of to self-determination by the Sahrawi, the Sahrawi people, uh, the Western Sahrawi people. And so uh, uh, Morocco gained the northern two thirds of the era and consequently controlled control of the population as well. Um, so uh, then, you know, you have sporadic fighting developed between the Polisario Front, uh, which was supported by and based in Algeria and the Moroccan forces. And what happened that is that in 1976, yes, 76, the Polisario Front declared a government in exile uh, of what it called the Saharan Arab Democratic Republic, and it continued to raid, uh, you know, Morocco an out, outpost in Western Sahara. So today there is this entire question about self-determination. The Sahrawi want to self-determinate, you know, and they claim their, their, their right for this and Algeria back them in that. And I think Algeria will continue to back them in that because again, historically speaking, this is a country that has been always, you know, fighting colonialism that has fought it for years. And for it, it is just, you know, so natural to continue to uh, help uh, the people uh, who are in the same situation. And who are these people in the region? Well, you have the Western Sahrawi, so the Western Sahara, and you have the Palestinian. And these two causes are very dear to Algeria as a country, but to the Algerian population as a whole. Yes. Eddie, <laughs> wait. Is there anybody else out there that would ask a question? I, I can't uh, get this chat thing to, to work properly and I'm missing out, I'm sure, on uh, some of the questions there that uh, come. Just, Mal, can you, can you help me? There's a question from Tyler okay. who asked essentially, the Chinese have been pushing westward with their Belt and Road, both in, in uh, Southern Europe, in the Middle East. Have the Chinese made significant efforts to promote their Belt and Road initiatives in Algeria? If so, what have the results been? Uh, yes, of course, and I wrote a piece about it called the, the, uh, the um, I think it was called the China Syndrome. Um, uh, yes, of course, Algiers and Beijing, you know, have improved their economic ties. Uh, and, you know, uh, they have a lot of uh, cooperation uh, in uh, economic cooperation, of course, but uh, a bit cultural also. But again, Algeria can certainly benefit more. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I noticed in, um, uh, you know, in my piece is that, uh, uh, of course, you know, the Chinese, uh, for the Chinese, Algeria is the, the, the uh, and Tunisia, of course, actually the Maghreb, but Algeria and Tunisia more are the doors to, to uh, a deeper and stronger presence in Africa. Uh, so uh, China or Beijing was seeking and has been seeking political support from the continent at the international level and greatest access to African countries and African African markets, new export destination, and you know it has been trying to secure supplies of oil and minerals. So, uh, in pursuit of such objective, you know Chinese firms have been very active, you know, and particularly involved in the Algerian construction sector. For instance, when you go to Algeria, it's something that strike you. Um, you know, uh, in 2014, for instance, uh, Algeria became uh, the second largest market for Chinese infrastructure investment and contract in Africa after Nigeria and uh, was among uh, the top 15 worldwide. So there is this cooperation, but again, it is imbalanced. Um, you know, uh, it is not uh, really for the benefit of uh, the Algerians. For instance, you know, um, uh, Chinese migrants uh, are more present in, uh, in Algeria, which is uh, great, uh, but at, actually Algeria is one of the country with the, 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 the biggest Chinese community uh, in the continent. Uh, however, when, when it comes, for instance, to uh, economic uh, cooperation, and for instance, when you have Chinese workers uh, coming to build, for instance, 
assistance and infrastructure. Uh, usually the details of the contract said that uh, in order to have a balanced cooperation, we need to have more than 50% of the employees being from Algeria, you know, in order, you know, to absorb uh, empl uh, an employment. Um, but uh, for instance, for one of the biggest projects that the Chinese did back then was the mosque of Algiers, the big mosque of Algiers. Uh, the day of the opening of the, the infrastructure, uh, the day of the opening of the, 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 the working um, uh, in the, the mosque, more than 11,000 Chinese workers were already there. So this is not really for the benefit of Algerians and that created frustration. And so many Algerians to whom you can talk to would tell you that they are coming and they are between quotes, stealing our jobs. Uh, so I would push for a, a better relationship and more balanced relationship, at least in, economically for Algeria, so there is another actor that we haven't talked about, and I, I recently wrote a piece about uh, China is important in Algeria, but Turkey is becoming more and more important in Algeria. And this is a really important trade partner for uh, Algeria that has been, you know, uh, very good at, uh, you know, uh, projecting uh, an image, a strong image of its power uh, via, you know, cultural links, cultural, uh, you know, uh, relationship, but also via this soft diplomatic soft power, you know, uh, today Algerians consume a lot of, of Turkish goods. And actually the made in Turkey has made its proof in Algeria. And uh, thanks to that, it is uh, really invading, if I may say, other markets in Tunisia in, uh, and in the Sahel. One of the questions that you talked about quite a bit was the corruption. But take that corruption from a, maybe use the terminology a little different. When we looked at at the time of, of the Arab Spring, Egypt's military was said to control a substantial part of the economy. More recently, in Iran, we hear that the military or other groups control a substantial part of the, of, of the economy. Is that the case of the military in Algeria, that they are not, you know, we don't use, we use the word corruption, but, but, not, not really. Uh, it's not like in Egypt. I do know that in Egypt, you know, the, the Egyptian military control something uh, like 70% of the economy. But in Algeria, no, it's different. Uh, first of all, we don't have the same type of, you know, uh, liberalized uh, economy. This is, as I said it in the beginning, it's a very controlled, liberalized economy. And so it benefited to some generals and to a business class. Uh, it's uh, funny to say that in the 90s, for instance, Algerians, in order to talk about the, um, the, the, the general without naming them, uh, because these generals used to have, you know, the monopoly of uh, import and export of some goods, but uh, uh, more uh, import, they used to call them, for instance, le général du café, le général du thé, which means the general of coffee, the general of, uh, of tea, the general of sugar, because they used to have monopolies. So this is what exists in Algeria. Some top high ranking generals have monopoly. Why? Because the import export licenses are giving to, again, these people who are actually controlling the entire license and agreement. And so this is why I insist on liberalized economy. It only benefits this very small circle of high ranking generals of some members of the bureaucracy, meaning some uh, of, you know, the FLN, and also some business tycoon. And, uh, you know, we've seen it recently when Bouteflika fell in 2019, his coterie and his clique that was composed of bureaucrats, but politicians, former minister and business tycoon also fell and many of them were jailed by the military for embezzlement and corruption. Alia, you've been going strong and charmingly for an hour, and we appreciate your coming all that way by your waves electronic from Paris and to be with us today. 
uh, I would like to say, in addition, that you have been the most enthusiastic responders, responses to my emails of anyone I have ever had. I, it's, just, it's just been wonderful that I know you're going to come back and you're going to be enthusiastic and you're going to be willing to do what we want and join us. And here you are in your youth and charm and it's been super. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, madame. C'était un plaisir d'être avec vous. Plaisir partagé. Anyway, and I hand you over to Mal, who is also charming in his way. Well, that's the nicest thing you've said about <laughs> the, the, the several years, Donald. <laughs> I had no care. I had no idea you cared. <laughs> Many thanks, anyway. Natalia, for insightful and effective discussion today. It's an important topic, but little discussed in the foreign policy world. She did a great job for us. We also thank Don for his work of recruiting Dalia and for hosting today, to Joan, to Kerry, all the people at the library who support us for years and years and years. And thanks to all of you who are off campus, wherever you are for your continued participation and support. On Monday the 28th, we will host Professor Robert Suter from George Washington University, who will discuss the US policy on Taiwan. I can't think of a more conflicted or, or timely topic, and we're looking forward to seeing you again. Joan, the program is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mal. Thank you, Dahlia, and thank you, Don. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with the three of you. And Don, uh, you're right, Dahlia was the most enthusiastic of all the emails we have ever received from one of the foreign policy speakers. Um, and also one of the most entertaining. Thank you, Dahlia. So I just encourage anybody who is here maybe for the first time, don't forget we videotape all our programs, not only the foreign policy discussion groups, but all of the programs that we have. And you can see them on our archived site which is chappaqualibrary.org. If you have any questions on how to access it, please email, email me. I left my email address in the chat function. So I wish you all a very happy um, Valentine's Day. And I know uh, it's not very popular where you are, Dahlia, but here in the United States, it is. And so I wish all of you a very happy uh, Valentine's Day and, uh, and a very good week. See you again in two weeks, or if not, I'll see you earlier on the programs we're having on Wednesday we? on Jerry Mulligan. All right, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Dahlia. Bye, Dahlia. Bye, Dahlia. Bye, Dahlia.